Cutaneous nerves, superficial veins and lymphatic drainage of upper limb. Introduction The superficial fascia seen after the reflection of skin contains cutaneous nerves, cutaneous or superficial veins and lymphatics. The cutaneous nerves are the continuation of the spinal nerves and carry sympathetic fibers for supplying the sweat glands, arterioles in the dermis and erector pylorum muscles in relation to the hair follicle. Thus, the effects of sympathetic on the skin are pseudomotor, increase sweat secretion, vasomotor, narrow the arterioles of skin, and pilomotor, contract erector pylorum muscle to make the hair erect or straight, respectively. The nerves also carry sensation of pain, touch, temperature, and pressure. Superficial veins are seen along with the cutaneous nerves. These are utilized for giving intravenous transfusions, cardiac catheterization, and taking blood samples. Lymphatic vessels are not easily seen in ordinary dissection. Cutaneous nerves dissection. Make one horizontal incision in the arm at its junction of upper one-third and lower two-third segments, see Fig 3.2, and a vertical incision through the center of arm and forearm till the wrist where another transverse incision is given. Reflect the skin on either side on the front as well as on the back of the limb. Use this huge skin flap to cover the limb after the dissection. Position The skin of the upper limb is supplied by 15 sets of cutaneous nerves, table 7.1. Out of these only one set, supraclavicular, is derived from the cervical plexus, and another nerve, intercostobrachial, is derived from the second intercostal nerve. The remaining 13 sets are derived from the brachial plexus through the musculocutaneous, median, ulnar, axillary, and radial nerves. Some branches arise directly from the medial cord of the p -lexus .it sold be noted as follow, the areas of distribution of peripheral cutaneous nerves do not necessarily correspond with those of individual spinal segments. Areas of the skin supplied by individual spinal segments are called derm atoms. This is so because each cutaneous nerve contains fibers from more than one ventral ramus, of a spinal nerve, and each ramus gives fibers to more than one cutaneous nerve. Adjacent areas of skin supplied by different cutaneous nerves overlap each other to a considerable extent. Therefore, the area of sensory loss after damage to a nerve is much less than the area of distribution of the nerve. The anesthetic area is surrounded by an area in which the sensations are somewhat altered. In both the upper and lower limbs, the nerves of the anterior surface have a wider area of distribution than those supplying the posterior surface. The individual cutaneous nerves, from above downwards, are described below with their root values. Figure 7.1 shows the cutaneous nerves of the upper limb. 1. The supraclavicular nerves, C3, C4, are branches of the cervical plexus. They pierce the deep fascia in the neck, descend superficial to the clavicle, and supply, a the skin of the pectoral region up to the level of second rob skin covering the upper half of the deltoid. 2. The upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, C5, C6, is the continuation of the posterior branches of the axillary nerve. It supplies the skin covering the lower half of the deltoid. The lower lateral quaineobs nerve of the arm, C5, C6, is a branch of the radial nerve given off in the radial groove. It supplies the skin of the lower half of the lateral side of the arm. 4. The intercostobrachial nerve, T2, is the lateral cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve. It crosses the axilla, and supplies the skin of the upper half of the medial and posterior parts of the arm. It lies amongst the central group of axillary lymph nodes. 5. The medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, TL, T2, is the smallest branch of the medial cord of the brachial plexus. 6. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm, C5, is a branch of the radial nerve given off in the axilla. It supplies the skin of the back of the arm from the insertion of the deltoid to the olecranon. 7. The lateral sebphanio BS nerve of the forearm, C5, C6, is the continuation of the musculocutaneous nerve. 
It pierces the deep fascia just lateral to the tendon of the biceps 2-3 cm above the bend of the elbow, and supplies the skin of the lateral side of the forearm, extending anteriorly to a small part of the ball of the thumb. 8. The media cutaneous nerve of the forearm, C8, T1, is a branch of the medial cord of the brachial plexus. It runs along the medial side of the axillary and brachial arteries, and supplies the skin of the medial side of the forearm. 9. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm, C6 C8, arises from the radial nerve, in the radial groove. It descends posterior to the lateral epicondyle and supplies the skin of the back of the forearm. 10. The median nerve gives off two sets of cutaneous branches in the hand. The palmer C0 Eneo 0 S branch, C6 C8, arises a short distance above the Irish, lies superficial to flexor retinaculum and supplies skin over the lateral two-thirds of the palm including that over the thenar eminence. Paul Renard digital branches, C6 C8, are five in number and arise in the palm. The medial two branches are common Paul Renard digital nerves, each divides near a digital cleft to form two proper Paul Renard digital nerves. The lateral three branches are proper Paul Renard digital nerves for the medial and lateral sides of the thumb and for the lateral side of the index finger. The various digital branches of the median nerve supply Paul Renard skin of the lateral three and a half digits, the nail beds, and skin on the dorsal aspect of the distal phalanges of the same digits. 11. The ulnar nerve gives off three sets of cutaneous nerves in hand. The Paul Renard cutaneous branch, C7, C8, arises in the middle of the forearm and descends, crossing superficial to flexor retinaculum and supplies skin of the medial one-third of the palm. The Paul Renard digital branches of the ulnar nerve, C7, C8, are two in number. They arise from the superficial terminal branch of the ulnar nerve just distal to the pisiform bone. The medial of the two branches is a proper Paul Renard digital nerve for the medial side O1 the little finger. The lateral branch is a common Paul Renard digital nerve which divides into two proper digital nerves for supply of adjacent sides of the ring and little fingers. The dorsal branch of the ulna R nerve, C7, C8, arises about 5 cm above the wrist. It descends with the main trunk of the ulnar nerve almost to the pisiform bone. Here it passes backwards to divide into three, sometimes two, dorsal digital nerves. Typically, the region of skin supplied by the dorsal branch covers the medial half of the back of the hand, and the skin on the dorsal aspect of the medial two and a half fingers. Note that the terminal parts of the dorsal aspect of the digits are supplied by the median nerve as described above. 12. The superior terminal branch of the radial nerve, C6 C8, arises in front of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It descends through the upper two thirds of the forearm lateral to the radial artery and then passes posteriorly about 7 cm above the wrist. While winding round the radius it pierces the deep fascia and divides into 4 or 5 small dorsal digital nerves. In all, the superficial terminal branch supplies the skin of the lateral half of the dorsum of the hand, and the dorsal surfaces of the lateral two and a half digits including the thumb, except for the terminal portion supplied by the median nerve. The area of skin supplied by one spinal segment is called a dermatome. A typical dermatome extends from the posterior median line to the anterior median line around the trunk, see Fig 5.2. However, in the limbs the derm atoms have migrated rather irregularly, so that the original uniform pattern is disturbed. Embryological Basis The early human embryo shows regular segmentation of the body. Each segment is supplied by the corresponding segmental nerve. In an adult, all structures, including the skin, developed from one segment, are supplied by their original segmental nerve. The limb may be regarded as an extension of the body wall, and the segments from which they are derived can be deduced from the spinal nerve supplying them. The limb buds arise in the area of the body wall supplied by the lateral branches of anterior primary rami. The nerves to the limbs represent these branches, Fig 7.2. Lumportanti features. The cutaneous innervation of the upper limb is derived, A mainly from segments C5, C8 and T1 of the spinal cord. Partly from the overlapping segments from above, C3, 
C4, as well from below, T2, T3. The additional segments are found only at the proximal end of the limb, Fig 7.3. Since the limb bud appears on the ventrolateral aspect of the body wall, it is invariably supplied by the anterior primary rami of the spinal nerves. Posterior primary rami do not supply the limb. It is possible that the ventral and dorsal divisions of the trunks of the brachial plexus represent the anterior and posterior branches of the lateral cutaneous nerves. There is varying degree of overlapping of adjoining derm atoms, so that the area of sensory loss following damage to the cord or nerve roots is always less than the area of distribution of the derm atoms. 13 Each limb bud has a cephalic and a caudal border, known as preaxial and postaxial borders, respectively. In the upper limb, the thumb and radius lie along the preaxial border, and the lethal finger and ulna along the postaxial border. 5 The derm atoms of the upper limb are distributed in an orderly numerical sequence. Along the preaxial border from above downward, by segment C3-C6 with overlapping of the derm atoms. The middle three digits, index, middle, and ring fingers, and the adjoining area of the palm are supplied by segment C7. The postaxial border is supplied, from below upwards, by segment C8, T1, T2. There is overlapping of the derm atoms. As the limb elongates it rotates laterally and gets adducted and the central dermatome C7 gets pulled in such a way that these are represented only in the distal part of the limb, and are buried proximally. On the front of the limb, areas supplied by C5 and C6 segments adjoin the areas supplied by C8, T1, and T2 segments. There is a dividing line between them, known as the central axial line along which C7 is buried proximally. It reaches the skin just proximal to the wrist. On the back of the limb, C7 reaches the skin just proximal to the elbow. So the dorsal J line ends more proximal to the ventral axial line. There is no overlapping across the ventral and dorsal axial lines. CLNCA Anatomy The area of sensory loss of the skin, following injuries of the spinal cord or of the nerve roots, conforms to the derm atoms. Therefore, the segmental level of the damage to the spinal cord can be determined by examining the derm atoms for touch, pain, and temperature. Note that injury to a peripheral nerve produces sensory loss corresponding to the area of distribution of that nerve. The spinal segments do not lie opposite the corresponding vertebrae. In estimating the position of a spinal segment in relation to the surface of the body, it is important to remember that a vertebral spine is always lower than the corresponding spinal segment. As a rough guide it may be stated that in the cervical region there is a difference of one segment, e.g. the fifth cervical spine overlease the sixth cervical spinal segment. Spinal segments spine of vertebra superficial veins of the upper limb assume importance in medical practice because these are most commonly used for intravenous injections and for withdrawing blood for testing. General Remarks 1. Most of the superficial veins of the limb join together to form two large veins, cephalic, preaxial, and basilic, postaxial. An accessory cephalic vein is often present. 2. The superficial veins run away from pressure points. Therefore, they are absent in the palm, fist area, along the ulnar border of the forearm, supporting border, and in the back of the arm and trapezius region, resting surface. This makes the course of the vein spiral, from the dorsal to the ventral surface of the limb. 3. The preaxial vein is longer than the postaxial. In other words, the preaxial vein drains into the deep, axillary, vein more proximally, at the root of the limb, than the postaxial vein which becomes deep in the middle of the arm. 4. The earlier a vein becomes deep the better, because the venous return is then assisted by muscular compression. The load of the preaxial, cephalic, vein is greatly relieved by the more efficient postaxial, basilic, vein through a short sitcating channel, the median cubital vein situated in front of the elbow, and partly also by the deep veins through a perf orator vein connecting the median cubital with the deep vein. 5. The superficial veins are accompanied by cutaneous nerves and superficial lymphatics, and not by arteries. The superficial lymph nodes lie along the veins, and the deep lymph nodes along the arteries. 
6. The superficial veins are best utilized for intravenous injections. Individual veins. Dorsal venous arch. Dorsal venous arch lies on the dorsum of the hand, Fig 7.7a. Its afferents, tributaries, include, I3 dorsal metacarpal veins. A dorsal digital vein from the medial side of the little finger. A dorsal digital vein from the radial side of the index finger. 2 2 dorsal digital veins form the thumb. Most of the blood from the palm courses through veins passing around the margins of the hand and also by perforating veins passing through the interosseous spaces. Pressure on the palm during gripping fails to impede the venous return due to the mode of drainage of the palm into the dorsal venous arch. Its efferents are the cephalic and basilic veins. Cephalic vein. Cephalic vein is the preaxial vein of the upper limb, cf great saphenous vein of the lower limb. It begins from the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch. It runs upwards, through the roof of the anatomical snuff box, winds round the lateral border of the distal part of the forearm. Continues upwards in front of the elbow and along the lateral border of the biceps brachii, pierces the deep fascia at the lower border of the pectoralis major, runs in the deltopectoral groove up to the infraclavicular fossa, where it pierces the clavopectoral fascia and joins the axillary vein. At the elbow, the greater part of its blood is drained into the basilic vein through the median cubital rein, and partly also into the deep veins through the perforator vein. It is accompanied by the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and the terminal part of the radial nerve. An accessory cephalic vein is sometimes present. It ends by joining the cephalic vein near the elbow. Basilic vein. Basilic vein is the postaxial vein of the upper limb, cf short saphenous vein of the lower limb. It begins from the medial end of the dorsal venous arch. 7. The superficial veins are accompanied by cutaneous nerves and superficial lymphatics, and not by arteries. The superficial lymph nodes lie along the veins, and the deep lymph nodes along the arteries. 8. The superficial veins are best utilized for intravenous injections. Individual veins. Dorsal venous arch. Dorsal venous arch lies on the dorsum of the hand, Fig 7.7a. Its afferents, tributaries, include, 3 dorsal metacarpal veins. A dorsal digital vein from the medial side of the little finger. A dorsal digital vein from the radial side of the index finger. Two dorsal digital veins from the thumb. Most of the blood from the palm courses through veins passing around the margins of the hand and also by perforating veins passing through the interosseous spaces. Pressure on the palm during gripping fails to impede the venous return due to the mode of drainage of the palm into the dorsal venous arch. Its efferents are the cephalic and basilic veins. Cephalic vein. Cephalic vein is the preaxial vein of the upper limb, cf great saphenous vein of the lower limb it begins from the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch it runs upwards through the roof of the anatomical snuff box winds round the lateral border of the distal part of the forearm continues upwards in front of the elbow and along the lateral border of the biceps brachii pierces the deep fascia at the lower border of the pectoralis major runs in the deltopectoral groove up to the infraclavicular fossa where it pierces the clavopectoral fascia and joins the axillary vein. At the elbow, the greater part of its blood is drained into the basilic vein through the median cubital rein, and partly also into the deep veins through the perforator vein. It is accompanied by the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, and the terminal part of the radial nerve. An accessory cephalic vein is sometimes present. It ends by joining the cephalic vein near the elbow. Basilic vein Basilic vein is the postaxial vein of the upper limb, cf short saphenous vein of the lower limb. It begins from the medial end of the dorsal venous arch, Fig 7.7a. I it runs upwards along the bavk of the medial border of the forearm winds round this border near the elbow, continues upwards in front of the elbow, medial epicondyle, and along the medial margin of the biceps brachii up to the middle of the arm, where it pierces the deep fascia, and runs along the medial side of the brachial artery up to the lower border of teres major where it becomes the axillary vein. About 2.5 cm above the medial epicondyle of the humerus, it is joined by the median cubital vein. 
it is accompanied by the posterior branch of the forearm and the terminal part of the dorsal branch of ulnar nerve. Median cubital vein Medial cubital vein is a large communicating vein which shunts blood from the cephalic to the basilic vein, Fig 7.7b. It begins from the cephalic vein 2.5 cm below the bend of the elbow, runs obliquely upward and medially, and ends in the basilic vein 2.5 cm above the medial epicondyle. It is separated from the brachial artery by the BC pital aponeurosis. It may receive tributaries from the front of the forearm, median vein of the forearm, and is connected to the deep veins through a perf orator vein which pierces the BC pital aponeurosis. The perf orator vein fixes the median cubital vein and thus makes it ideal for intravenous injections median vein of the forearm it begins from the planar venous network and end in any one of the veins in front of the elbow mistelli in median cubital veins deep veins deep veins start as small vena mitantes running on each side of the digital veins. These continue proximally as superficial and deep palrenar arches then, these course proximally to continue as vena comitants of radial and ulnar arteries, which further join to form the brachial veins. Brachial veins lie on each side of brachial artery these join the axillary vein at the lower border of teres major. Axillary vein is described in axilla the median cubital vein is the vein of choice for intravenous injections, for withdrawing blood from donors, and for cardiac catheterization, because it is fixed by the perf orator and does not SLLP away during piercing. When the median cubital vein is absent, the basilic is preferred over the cephalic because the former is a more efficient channel, Fig 7.8. Basilic vein runs along straight path, whereas cephalic vein bends acutely to drain into the axillary vein. The cephalic vein frequently communicates with the external jugular vein by means of a small vein which crosses in front of the clavicle. In operations for removal of the breast, in carcinoma, the axillary lymph nodes are also removed, and it sometimes becomes necessary to remove a segment of the axillary vein also. In these cases, the communication between the cephalic vein and the external jugular vein enlarges considerably and helps in draining blood from the upper limb, Fig 7.9. In case of fracture of the clavicle, the rupture of the communicating channel may lead to formation of a large hematoma, i.e. collection of blood. When circulating blood reaches the capillaries, part of its fluid content passes through them into the surrounding tissue as tissue quid. Most of this tissue fluid re-enters the capillaries at their venous ends. Some of it is, however, returned to the circulation through a separate set of lymphatic reserals. These vessels begin as lymphatic capillaries which drain into larger vessels. Along the course of these lymph vessels there are groups of lymph nodes. Lymph vessels are difficult to see and special techniques are required for their visualization. Lymph nodes are small bean-like structures that are usually present in groups. These are not normally palpable in the living subject. However, they often become enlarged in disease particularly by infection or by malignancy in the area from which they receive lymph. They then become palpable and examination of these nodes provides valuable information regarding the presence and spread of disease. It is, therefore, of importance for the medical student to know something of the lymphatic drainage of the different parts of the body. Lymph nodes. The main lymph nodes of the upper limb are the axillary lymph nodes. These comprise anterior, posterior, lateral, central, and apical groups. Other nodes are as follows. 1. The infraclavicular nodes lie in or on the clavipectoral fascia along the cephalic vein. They drain the upper part of the breast, and the thumb with its web. 2. The deltopectoral node lies in the deltopectoral groove along the cephalic vein. It is a displaced node of the infraclavicular set, and drains similar structures. 3. The superficial cubital or supertrochlear nodes lie just above the medial epicondyle along the basilic vein. They drain the ulnar side of the hand and forearm. 4. A few other deep lymph nodes lie in the following regions. I. Along the medial side of the brachial artery. At the bifurcation of the brachial artery, deep cubital lymph node. Occasionally along the arteries of the forearm. Lymphatics. Superficial lymphotics. Superficial lymphatics are much more numerous than the deep lymphatics. They collect lymph from the skin and subcutaneous tissues. 
most of them ultimately drain into the axillary nodes, except for, a few vessels from the medial side of the forearm which drain into the superficial cubital nodes. A few vessels from the lateral side of the forearm which drain into the deltopectoral or infraclavicular nodes. The dense pulmonar plexus drains mostly into the lymph vessels onto the dorsum of the hand, where these continue with the vessels of the forearm. Lymph vessels of the back of forearm and arm curve round their medial and lateral surfaces and ascend up to reach the floor of the axilla. Thus, there is a vertical area of lymph shed in the middle of back of forearm and arm, Fig 7.10. Deep lymphatics are much less numerous than the superficial lymphatics. They drain structures lying deep to the deep fascia. They run along the main blood vessels of the limb, and end in the axillary nodes. Some of the lymph may pass through the deep lymph nodes present along the axillary vein as mentioned above, Fig 7.10. Clinical anatomy inflammation of lymph vessels is known as lymphangitis. In acute lymphangitis, the vessels may be seen through the skin as red, tender, painful to tooth, streaks the nodes enlarge and become palpable and painful. Obstruction to lymph vessels can result in accumulation of tissue fluid in areas of drainage. This is called lymphoedema. This may be caused by carcinoma. Infection with some parasites like filaria, or because of surgical removal of lymph nodes. Pain along the medial side of upper arm is due to pressure on the intercostobrachial nerve by enlarged central group of axillary lymph nodes. Ventral axial line ends close to wrist joint, while dorsal axial line ends close to elbow joint. Dermatome is an area of skin supplied by single spinal segment through a pair of right and left spinal nerves with both its dorsal and ventral rami. There is no overlapping of the nerve supply across the axial lines. Cephalic vein at its beginning in the anatomical snuff box and median cubital vein near the elbow are the veins of choice for intravenous infusions. Median cubital vein is protected from the brachial artery by the BC pital aponeurosis.